Hey, um, thanks for coming uh, this week. Um, so this week we are continuing to work through the JavaScript section of um, outstanding user interfaces with Shiny um, uh, as, as part of the book club on, on, on R for Data Science. The chapter today, uh, chapter 14, is about events in, in, in Shiny. And events are like... Um, kind of signals that are um, kind of accessible in, in the front end. So when an um, event is fired in the front end, there might be an, an event handler that, that captures that and, 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 and causes some change to happen in the, the front end code. Um, we actually discussed events um, in earlier chapters so um, there were a couple of examples where um, we were writing custom events to, um, um, to I think it was to, to, to basically to transfer user input. We were defining a, a kind of custom inputs for, for, for Shiny. And within that, we were having to define a, events that get triggered when the user inputs data into those, if, if I remember rightly. This chapter is more about the um, default um, events that are available in Shiny. And there's actually, um, where is it now? Um, there is a, um, it's quite an old document now, but one that was put together a while ago um, for shiny developers. So I believe it's something that Eway wrote. Um, and I mean, if you, if you go into this website here, the shiny articles on the, the posit website, um the yeah sorry this was written in 2015 uh by the you know the r markdown nitar kind of um guy um there are a lot of different events that can be triggered in a shiny app and and the one the ones that are covered in this document are the ones that are kind of associated with the shiny package itself so other packages will define their own events um so there's actually a list at the bottom of, of different things that can be flagged up in a a, a a JavaScript, you know, in in the to the front end to the JavaScript um, that's that's running in in the front end while your shiny apps being used by a user. Um, so there are various things, whether it's connected or disconnected whether the session's been initialized. Relatively few of these are actually mentioned in um, the chapter that we're going to talk about. But I did think it was important to flag up this, um, this article. You know, I'd be surprised if there aren't additional uh, uh, events find within Shiny now that, that haven't been added to this, if it, considering it was written such a while ago. Anyway, let's get back into the book. So um, I don't have any notes for this week, I'm afraid. I, 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 I just, I just, I, I'm struggling with time at the moment. Um, so we've um, in the book that we've been working through, we've seen quite a few um, different events that um, so one that was mentioned during the, the shiny life cycle image, I think, was shiny connected. And, and what, that hap what that means is that the WebSocket's been put in place and the client and server are initialized and any kind of um, app-related methods are, are now available to JavaScript um, in, in the front end. Um, da, da, da. Um, yeah, so 
there's a, a number of other of these types of events that that will um, be mentioned in this um, chapter. In fact, uh, yeah, the first example is um, to do with waiter, which I don't know if you've ever used. Um, this is like a way of creating. Um, where are we? Where's the examples? So if we do, which one is it now? Yeah, so there's little, you know, spinners and um, and things like that defined in in waiter. And what what that is is it's it will tell the user that something's loading or something like that. And and in order for it to work, it needs to know something about the state of the shiny app. The 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 waiter itself runs in the front end but can respond to events sent from the, the server. Um, so you might, um, you know, if your user selects a particular value uh, as part of their input, and that initializes some big computation or some big like, you know, database pull or something like that, some computation that might take a long time, um, uh the, the this waiter thing will be placed over part of the the user interface and when the computation is finished the results available and sent and, and can be sent back that waiter can be uh closed down so um and it's javascript events that kind of govern the um closing down of that that waiter you might not know this from the way it's written in you know the, the the relevant R package. Um, so so the first kind of example is um, is um, about finding um, inputs in a shiny app that have recently changed. So. You can imagine um, in, a, in a typical app, you might have a few drop downs, a few text boxes and things like that. And when the user enters or selects uh, on these things, um, uh, their values get sent to the server. But you might want to know uh, on the, the front end, which was the last of those elements to be updated. And that's something that you can uh, find using um, using a um, event. Now I'm trying to find. Yes, so this is an example of how you might do it um, without JavaScript, basically. So you'd have, you have a user interface that has uh, a text input and um, an output and then uh, let's see if we can run it and see what it actually does. Yes, so this here, text B is, um, is the text output, right? And what that um, is, it's the last variable to be updated within this shiny app. So if I click um, one, two, three in there, it will be updated to text A. If I click something in here, it will be changed to text C and so on. Um, UI so it's UI. Yeah, so there's no use of um, Shiny's events in, in this example. All that you're doing, you've got a, a kind of um, values to our last updated is um, 
must update it it's null then um, whenever any of the inputs are modified um, da, 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 then the last updated value stored in there is um, modified to contain the name of the input that was updated and it's a little bit um, it you know it works but it's a bit clunky and really it, it's like it's doing stuff that maybe the front end should already know anyway so why you have to tra transfer the big loop from the front end to the server and back to the front end to, to, to get that information um, <clears throat> Um, so um, the uh, there's a, a slightly simpler way to do the same thing um, using events. So all these examples that you can run from the, um, the books um, package um, and yes, so the the events that we're going to look for is shiny input changed. Um, when we've talked about events in the previous chapters, we always said, you know, if you're developing your own package, put your package name as the first part of the event name, and then the type of event that it refers to in, in, in the second part and, and separate them with a colon, which is, what's going on with these shiny events as well. Um, so input changed has five properties associated with it. Um, so when you um, capture a input changed event in your code, the um, the event itself will have a few properties associated with it. Um, let's see if we can get that to run. How can I do that? Right, so if I copy this over. Ah, stop it. All right, if I copy it over. Right, so have a see what's this actually mean so we've added um ooh, i'll open it in the browser because it's always easier to debug these things in the browser oh <laughs> unless you close the app <laughs> sorry um let's do that again right in the, in the browser um so what are we trying to do here we are what is the thing that should be happening? So you've got a, a text input. Um, when an input changes, we're going to print out the contents of the associated event. So it's when you see this shiny input changed event, there's a bunch of data associated with that. And we're going to print out the data associated with it in this kind of toy example here. So if we do see, you can't see anything here because I haven't put the inspector on, but if you look in the console, um, let's do that. And we get a input changed event. Let's have a see, did that? And then if I press return as well, we get an input change as well. So um, if we expand this, oh, I didn't think it would be quite as big as that. There's target handle object element. Oh, there's more than five bits of data associated. Um, what did it say? What are the ones we have to focus on? The name, value, input type, binding, and element. element, uh, name, 
input type, um, and a, f a few other things. So we can actually, um, that's stuff that we can capture and manipulate when inside an event handler like this. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, so when you enter input into that uh, text box, if you the the event is fired, and um, and you know whatever is the most recent change to to an input variable is is kind of printed out to the console. Um, da, da, da. There is something in there called input type. One of one of the properties that were flagged input type here is an empty string although this is like a, a text box so if we hold on if we inspect that um, it's a it's got an ID of test it's a type the the input has a type attribute called that, that, that has the value text but when you actually look at the input type of the element that triggered that input changed event it doesn't have a any any text in there um, so it's not entirely informative for every element so yeah they flag it up in the book that some some of the input types don't have a value um, and you can get the um, name of the input input binding um, and extract its name. So this is some code that we should be able to run in the console. I zoom down here. What we're doing is we've bound a new um, event handler to the input changed event, and when when I now type some stuff in, it should um, it should Ugh. no, sorry, <laughs> I've made a mistake here. I think um, the, 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 the set input value. Please stay home. So it should be doing. What's it doing here? That's funny. That's a weird example, I guess. Um, this will um, does not always have a name in this case. I think if we probably if we change that there, it will change the input value associated with this variable um, what what the example is trying to do is change the values associated with an input value called please stay home but anyway I think we'll zip on from that I'm not quite sure what the, the example is trying to show really um, what we could uh, we could probably just print out the type it a bit more simply if we I think the please stay home part, Russ. I, I was looking ahead. I, I think it's um, it's basically going to be like whatever whatever input you want to populate. I, I don't know why they had a weird, mm. weird name there. It's not logged anything. Um, yeah, it's a bit difficult now that I've got multiple additional um, uh, login events. Um, 
Let's see if I can get it to work. If I respot the app. Close that. Close that. And then open that. No more. Okay. If I put this in. It's a text input uh, thing. So that's the input type of the um, of the element that we've interacted with. Anyway, um, right. So if you use that code. Um, It is, uh, yeah, it's possible that the the binding event, um, so what we're doing, was, are we splitting event.binding.name? Input binding doesn't have a name, which would thereby make one crash. So set input value of last change to this. Right, so this app here is going to um, set the input. Ah, yeah, input dollar last changed. Right, yeah, so it's going to take it's going to set a variable in your input dollar, um, you know, list um, that has the this name, this value, and this type, right? Um, and if we run that, then the the text input is is modified. Um, this last changed input variable is going to be updated by JavaScript directly. Um, and then you'll have access to that um, without having to do all those observers in the server side to get the most recently changed variable there. So I can if I close that, close that. So if I do let me see if it's a browser issue. Oh, sorry, I should have run the examples earlier on. <laughs> um, right, okay. What have I done wrong here? What have I done wrong? On input change. Copy it in, okay. Changed. Hmm. It's funny. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I can't see any difference between. I mean, the code looks fine to me, but. Um, Anyway, um, right. It's a failed example, um, and and what that was aiming to do was to show that you could purely using front end code, you could um, determine which of the uh, inputs in an app was the most recently changed one. Um, and oh yeah, uh, this is actually a cancelable event. So um, so you can um, how does what does that mean? Um, so in fourteen four, cancel the input update on the client. So if we 
be more than that. What this so when an input changes, it's going to call this method here in events dot prevent default, which um, will in in some ways it kind of prevent you from prevent the input value from propagating over to the server, I think, if I run that. OK, let me try that again. So if I try, yeah, so now I'm entering input into this. Um, as far as shiny code's concerned, that would normally mean that um, the values entered by the user would get bound to this variable. Um, and then, you know, in response to changes in that, this output variable will get updated and printed to the screen. But because we've got this um, uh, prevent default uh, thing, the changes that occur in that input um, are, are no longer populated over to, um, to server side variables. Okay, um, right. So, um, yes, there's a, oh, I maybe don't have shiny more. Oh. Um, yeah, so we've got an example here, um, and um, yeah, it it store shiny mobiles like um, for defining shiny apps that that will work in you know on Android phones and, and stuff like that, um, and. Um, we can, it has a, um, you can actually access an input variable called last input change without actually defining it yourself. Um, input dollar last input changed here. So if you look through the user interface code here, there's no actual input binding that's called last input changed. But the app itself has access to a variable with, with that name. Um, so we can, um, we can run that app. There. Okay. Uh, I haven't actually run this example at all. Um, now, what's it going to print out at the bottom? It's going to print out the last changed this text here, right? So if I change range, do, do, do. so it printed it. F seven card. Oh, jeez. It's not printing it in the. What, what have I done wrong here? Toolbar. So there's the slider, and then underneath the slider. Ah, right. So what it's printing out. Um, sorry, I was expecting it to just print out the name of the variable. It's printed out the name, the value, and the input type that's associated with the most recently updated input in the app. Um, so that's what these values are um, doing. So I can change it and have access to those values quite easily. Um, yeah, 
so that's quite neat so um that's presumably there's an event defined within the shiny mobile um javascript code that will bind um the the you know the the values and identifiers and stuff associated with the most recent um the most recently updated thing to um to input dollar last input changed um yeah um there is a package now i'm trying to remember which one this is shiny logs is um nice documentation um so it stores kind of information about um usage and, and things like that um so it yeah it can record how inputs and outputs change and things like that in order to do that it needs to have access to um stuff that's happening on the front end um which you know if you were doing it if i was doing it normally i i might try and store a kind of expanding list of values by writing server-side code um but you can um you can actually just call track usage on that package and it will store any changes to inputs and outputs and stuff that, that happen during the usage of the app. Should we run that? Oh, I don't, I definitely won't have that installed. Mm. Yeah, um, and, and the only way that that can really work is if it, has access to you know input changed and output changed type events um in uh shiny so where was the list of them again at the bottom um so we've looked at um input changed input changed and yeah there were other uh things that are frequently used shiny busy and shiny idle in testing situations and things um but yeah I, I don't really use events that much but um they are quite useful when um you uh really need them we'll just wait for this thing to to install um but this is the kind of output that you get from shiny logs so what's happening is that the app is running and um while it runs you get a kind of a, an output to the console of the element name and values and things that that get modified while the user's interacting with it um so Hopefully we'll be able to do that in a second. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so it's this track usage function that's the most relevant here. And if you look at this side by side with the um, console itself, um, I can up that to two, to three, four, five. I can change it to 12. Um, I can slide this and yeah, so name is S. So presumably that's the slider. Um, and you have timestamp values and things like that and the type and the binding and stuff. So that, uh, yeah, all of this kind of code is, is based on um, tracking the events on the, the front end of the code um yeah um so he, here they're talking about the waiter uh package in a bit more detail 
Um, so waiter is like f for putting up loading screens on either on individual elements or across the whole um, of the app. So for example, you might not want to show all of the, you might not want to show the app until all its data acquisition steps are, are finished when it's initially loading or something like that. Or you might not want to um, show a specific element until the until you know some simulation has run or something like that um so we've got a few things here we've got waiter preloader and we've got waiter on busy so this uh preloader is for um um basically hiding the app until until the un until it's all ready until all the kind of um you know data movements on the back end have finished um so what actually happens is this kind of depends upon an event called shiny idle um yeah so when a when a shiny app starts a few events are triggered so you get um if I remember rightly, it's yeah. session initialized occurs first, and then shiny connected occurs second. And then when all the computations finished and you're in a kind of steady, you know, stable state, the shiny idle event gets triggered. Um, later on during the app you know when you're clicking on inputs and outputs are being created and things like that the idle event is triggered again when any computations have finished um, and conversely there's a shiny busy event as well that, that gets kicked off when some computations are, are, are occurring in the uh, server side um yeah so we call this function um in uh, where was it in the user interface and that will mean that an that whatever app you've got here so this is an app that will just sleep for three seconds uh, and then do something um while those three seconds, uh, while we're waiting for those three seconds, this preloader page will show. Um, let's see if I um, but uh, yeah, so um, the the event itself, though, um, what's happening here? So this is some JavaScript code. Uh, and the um, if you look in the, the you know the waiter source code, um, there's some code that looks like this where it's looking at the the whole of the app, waiting for um, this shiny idle event, and when it sees that event, it will. Um, well depending whether the waiting screen is visible at the moment or not, it will um, hide that waiting screen. Um, yeah, so so what that so you start off the app with the waiting screen um, visible. When the shiny idle event gets triggered, um, the waiting screen gets closed and you have a you know and at that point um it you have a kind of variable that like indicates that the initial waiting has 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 finished so sub any subsequent shiny idle events will ignore this 
block here because there's no way to, to hide, so there's no point in, in running that code. So if we do this, um, let's see, was run in then yeah, we've got the waiter running for three seconds, and then um, the app's visible if I put inspect on this and then reload it. Let them see what we got here. What would it be? Uh, console. So if we copied document on. So now, every time this computation finishes, um, you get this shiny idle event kicked off. And I've added a little bit of code to just kind of print out the ready, uh, like a you know a, a word to the console, um, just to illustrate when the idle event gets triggered. Um, um, yeah, and um, hold on, we'll have a look at the code again. Here, we're not writing any code that says, um, um, you know, we, we don't have to write any code in here that tells the waiter package to hide the... Um, waiting screen um, it's done kind of automatically for us um, using the you know when when the when the app's initially in it, in its ready state um, um, I've actually I, I've used that event quite a bit before um, when I, I used to write a lot of um, UI testing code as part of one of the projects that I worked on using something called Puppeteer, which is like a, um, um, it's like similar to like WebDriver. So it, it, it will interact with your app for you in a kind of automated way. Um, and computers are really fast and humans aren't quite so fast. So you can, you know, if you write your script um, for puppeteer in in, um, in a kind of lazy way, um, you can get into a state where the the script will run and it will trigger input, change this input, change this input, change this input, but it won't necessarily wait for the first input to change before. Um, changing the second input unless you put like either you know a hard-coded time weight or you put in a um, some um, way of checking that the first input has been changed and been registered and stuff and I found that the, the shiny idle event was actually quite useful for determining when um, for preventing you from doing it from your automated scripts from interacting with the app at, in a, a, a premature moment. Does that make sense? I don't know whether that makes sense. But, that makes perfect um, sense. Yeah. Um, I'm busy. Um, so the you know so the conversely um, you know o opposite to to shiny idle there's a shiny busy thing. So whenever this um things changed uh something gets printed out oh hold on i had it over here so if i do um if i copy that and paste that to busy i'll do that and okay 
And then if I do this, it's the running code showed up and then now it's ready. And if I change it again, so that busy event gets triggered as soon as I click that input that, you know, move that input. And then when all the computations finished, the idle event is triggered and it's printed out ready. So it's just a, a kind of example of how that works. But um, there'll be um, that 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 busy event is um, is is something that that that's used by the waiter package to hide specific elements. Um, or, or to hide the whole page while the app is busy. So um, you have here, this is binding to the whole app and checking for, you know, when the app is busy, um, you'll show a particular waiting screen. Um, so I think this is kind of a, a, a approximation to what goes on in the the waiter packages source code um, similarly um, when the um, when all the computations finished there's there's code to, to hide that waiting screen so um, we can do waiter on busy so I think what this app is going to do is it's going to hide the whole app when um, any computation is go go going to happen rather than hiding just the plot. Um, now, I think there is a way to, actually, I'm, I'm fairly certain that this. So what's going on here? Um, so that was an initial thing, and it was waiting for the um, idle state to occur. If I now change the input, it will go into the waiting screen again and then pop back out. Um, yeah, so it's, it's the same kind of server code, but we're using a... Uh, we're, using a waiting screen whenever the app is busy rather than just at the initial kind of boot up um yeah so the the two of them both depend on these shiny events um is the idle you can you can actually where's the way to package still i'm sure there was a, a really neat um example I, there was like a a really cool website that showed off how this worked. Um, yes, so you can like hide specific plots while the computation of that plot's underway. Um, that's for yeah, the hostess. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think you're going to attach it to like a particular UI element. Hmm. Yeah, so it's quite neat. Again, we'll probably be um, uh, w waiting for, um, you know, it will be, I don't know, probably attaching it, it, based on events that will um, change that specific user interface element. Um, so how do you, I don't know how you quite code that up, but there must be some uh, neat way that it's done. Anyway, um, yeah, so there are many more events. Um, so we've talked about um, uh, the shiny connected event. We session initial, initialized as well. These happen when the app initially opens. Then, um, while the initial kind of um, computations are happening, there'll be a busy event triggered. And then once all that computation's finished, you get an idle 
event triggered as well. Um, and you can use those events to modify bits of the user interface and things like that. Um, and to be honest, I think the code looks a lot neater when it's, for these specific examples, I think it looks a lot neater for it to be based in the JavaScript side than for it to, for you to have to have lots of observers and things like that in the server side. Um, but the examples were picked to uh, demonstrate those things quite well. I, I suspect that it, um, there, there may be there may be examples of, of, of where where some JavaScript based on event handling would be considerably more neat than the the sh the you know writing it in the server side code but where i wouldn't necessarily know what the right approach is in the javascript world because i'm just less fluent in that world but um yeah it's um um it's uh ah yes this is what it must be so um for those um you know the the kind of waiting screens that just occlude a single element um for for an out you, there's um events that 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 can be triggered to indicate that that particular element is being recalculated and i think you can bind them to specific elements but um, yeah anyway yes so that's um chapter 14 of the book um it's to be honest it, it's a lot more it it's a lot nicer to work through the online version of the book than the actual printed out version of the book because a lot of the source code is missing in the the printed out version of the book so i was like reading through it and thinking well i don't <laughs> this is all great but i don't know i can't really can't really envision what you're actually trying to kind of show but the examples are actually quite nice the, aside from that one the, the the couple that didn't quite work but it may just be because i rushed through them um anyway um so next week we are going to be talking about custom handlers so we've learned about events we're now going to be writing um, um customized ways of dealing with those events and um yeah um i think that's right anyway um yes that's next week um at the same time um yeah cool uh hopefully, hopefully today was interesting i mean the the events are, are kind of the they're, they're not something that i knew a great deal about until we did the javascript for our thing last year um but yeah they're very helpful in in certain settings but anyway thanks for coming along uh, both of you and i will see you all next week unless you have any questions right now Sorry. nice nice presentation russ <laughs> thanks yeah <laughs> thank you thank you yeah, no problem, no problem. Okay, right. I'll uh, speak to you all next week. See you later. See you then.